Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create film courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Uh, every week we interview film professionals, and this week I'm joined by editor Sandra Adair, whose work includes Dazed and Confused, The Before Trilogy, School of Rock, among many other fantastic films. And of course, she also had her director, directorial debut with a documentary, uh, The Secret Life of Lance Letcher. Uh, welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you. Glad to be uh, here. I would love to jump to your documentary as a director, because I find that fascinating that you did it on um, this particular individual, Lance. Well, what was it that drew you to that that topic? It's a really kind of, I went around about way to getting to direct a feature a doc. Essentially, I found out about Lance. He lives here in Austin, Texas, where I live. Mm -hmm. And I found out that he was making a metal mural for downtown Austin. He had been commissioned to do that. And He's known, and he is, a paper collage artist. Mm -hmm. And so my idea was to document him changing from paper, doing these minute paper collages, to doing a giant metal collage. And it, really, honestly, I just wanted to photograph that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I met him, he was such an interesting and like such a deep person and his paper collages were, are absolutely mesmerizing. And so as I got to meet him and know him, I was like, this is obviously a film. Like I, he, I just was very drawn to his work, mm -hmm. his method, his, his collage art is so similar to editing. I mean, we have found a lot of common ground in terms of his ability to cut you know, images out and put them on a board and mm -hmm. find a perfect place for them. And anyway, I found them really interesting. So it just evolved. And then as I was conducting interviews with him, I discovered that his father committed suicide after they had been estranged for a very long time. And then um, they developed a relationship and got close again. And then right after that, his father committed suicide and it had a profound impact on Lance. And so I think just in terms of the psychology of an artist who is so, you know, he's absolutely a workaholic. He works all day, every day, and he's very um, isolated, I would say. So I just found the whole story very, very compelling. Now, were you a fan of collage art beforehand or was this? I mean, I've always been a fan of art, period. Mm -hmm. So, um, but to find someone of his, the quality of his work in Austin, I was like, how have I lived in Austin nearly 30 years and I've never heard of this guy? Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's, it's a regional story as well. I mean, he was born and raised here. Yeah. Now, you also edited this film. So, how did you um, ensure that you you didn't have your blinders on or that you were able to be objective when you were cutting if you were also as the, uh, the director? I mean, first of all, I think I just knew I couldn't make a bad film about Lance Letcher. I felt <laughs> I held him in such high esteem and I just wanted it to be something that would reflect him in a way that would give an audience insight. So that was my main goal was not to make a bad film about mm -hmm. this wonderful man. Um, the directing and the editing, honestly, it was such a, I mean, it just, I didn't put on different hats. I feel like I wore my editing hat the whole entire time I was directing and vice versa. Um, I used like pretty similar documentary um, methods that other doc editors use, the three by five cards, finding a structure. You know, I had some interns from the University of Texas that were helping me log 
everything. And I had, you know, I just, I did it the normal way you would cut mm. a documentary. Um, the funny thing was that I really realized that there is no way this documentary is going to cut itself. Like I have to spend the time sitting in the chair yeah. in my office. I mean, I took a series of photographs of my car in the parking lot at my office morning, noon, night, empty parking lot. I have like a whole timeline of parking lot yeah. photos that shows, you know, I was there morning, noon yeah. and night until I got the thing cut. So it was like boyhood, but for your car. <laughs> your a car little bit, car. yes. Sunsets, <laughs> all that, yeah. Wow. And so I guess one of the, the questions I have for you is, now that you've directed this documentary, is there something that you learned from being a director that has sort of changed your perspective of working with directors as an editor? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I don't know that I've really ever thought about that it expanded. I mean, yes, actually, yes. Because I had some interns working with me um, and I asked them to like rough cut some scenes. Mm -hmm. And I, I was constantly trying to like almost grab the mouse and try to show them what yeah. I meant. And so I, I learned how useful it is to try to articulate what your thoughts are rather than trying to show and I think directors that are good at articulation in terms of what they're going for and in a broad sense, what their intent is, it's extremely helpful for an editor or an intern or anybody who's, who's approaching material that is raw, uncut. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be the main thing is like, how do you, how do you really describe what it is you're thinking? It's so interesting that you would say that because uh, anytime I've edited, you know, if you're talking to the director, it's like, well, let me show you. And, the, you know, because it's sort of almost like we've short circuited that ability to communicate Yeah, because it is yeah. so much easier now with the at the Avid or the Premiere Pro or whatever you're working on to just jump in and, and show them. Yes. Now, you've worked with uh, Richard Linklater for many years. How did that relationship come about? Um, I moved to Austin, Texas from Los Angeles in 1991. And um, I had been working as an assistant editor and starting my editing career in LA. And I moved to Austin and I didn't know how I was gonna make a living. I didn't know if there was gonna be anywhere to really mm -hmm. edit. Um, and I heard about this guy that was making a film for Universal. And I wrote him a letter, basically. I wrote him a snail mail letter, put my resume in there, mailed it off to the production office. And um, about three weeks later, I got a call from his producer to come in and interview for Dazed and Confused. And uh, at that time, he was already in pre-production. Mm -hmm. I think he already had a, a, an editor in mind that was a local uh, man who teaches at UT, Don mm -hmm. Howard. Um, but I had Hollywood experience and I had, you know, I had worked on big features before. So um, he brought me on and, and we really honestly didn't know each other at all at mm -hmm. the very beginning. So how do you build that relationship? So that, cause that's one of the things young editors have to learn is like, you're going to be working with this person in the room for days on end. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to build relationships. So how did you, do that with someone you never didn't know? Uh, I mean, I just, I thought, I think I'm a pretty easygoing person. Rick is extremely laid back and very willing to mm -hmm. watch. And, you know, he's just, he's open. He's open mm -hmm. to ideas. He's open to collaboration. He's open to your thoughts and conversation about work or otherwise. And, um, I think just sitting in the room and, and you become familiar with one another. You become familiar with how a director um, speaks about the characters. And I think, you know, a lot of it is just in a relationship intuition to mm -hmm. have an understanding of 
you know, he's not able to really exactly articulate what he wants, but I think I get the gist. So let me put it together like that. And then we can discuss. And, you know, you develop a language and you develop um, trust. I think it comes down to trust. Hmm. Interesting. Now he's had a very interesting career in that he's, you know, always challenging the medium, right? Whether it's, you know, the before series, whether it's boyhood, how do you, you know, how do you get on the same page with him when he comes to you with these crazy ideas? I'm always on the same page with him because I'm so excited. Every time we start a new project, I feel like this is going to be something completely new and different, but it's definitely going to be linked later. Mm -hmm. Like he has a very distinct style and a very distinct way of approaching whatever it is he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's fun. It's just really fun. So I am always, I want to be on every project he ever does because it's always new, interesting, challenging, all that. What is if for boyhood? What were some of the challenges in, in crafting that? Well, I mean, we didn't have a whole film until you're 12. <laughs> so also there was no script. I mean, there was a script, but I, there was no written script from beginning to end at the beginning. That was a script that evolved each year. There, I would get after they shot that year's segment, I would get the script for that year. Mm-hmm. And I, Rick and I had many, many, many conversations about, you know, what the islands were going to be that he knew were going to be big milestones in mm-hmm. um, the life of this kid. But, you know, it was kind of challenging not to know where it was going, what, mm-hmm. what was going to happen. There was a lot of tension in knowing that this project's going to go for 12 years. What happens if something happens to one of the actors? Yeah. You know, like what happens if um, the world goes upside down and we can't finish? And we, you know, so there was always this kind of like leap of faith that we were going to be able to make it the 12 years that everybody was going to stay on board and stay engaged for that long. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so fascinating because it's like, like I always, and I don't know if this is a fair comparison, but I always think of it like the up series by the documentary series where it's every seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's, at least it was, okay, it's year 14. We're going to follow them for X amount of time. Here's the footage. Let's cut it. Right. Uh, Whereas yours is it's sort of evolving as it's being shot and changing. So how did you like, were there any problems where, you, you know, like if you're working on a regular film, you can say, okay, well, the first act's not working. Can you go do some pickups or can we go do this? But if, you know, the young boy's scenes aren't working, we can't do pickups, you know, six years later. No, you can't. I mean, we did do ADR. Okay. I, we did keep track of any audio that we needed to replace because we were cognizant of the fact that their mm-hmm. voices were going to change. So we got any ADR or pick up lines that we needed as we went. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there were no redos. So, you know, we, that's the, the beauty of editing. (laughs) (laughs) It's the, yeah, that's a scary, (laughs) scary leap of faith. Yeah. Is there, is there a scene or a moment in your career that you're really proud of the editing you've done that you, um, you know, it goes on your reel or it's something you, you show people is this is something I'm really proud of? I mean, I think there are, are two. And yeah. as a whole, I don't think that I will ever be more proud than I am of, of boyhood as a whole, mm-hmm. because that film is so incredibly personal. And that was something, you know, that we all embraced. It was just a part of our lives for so long. And the fact that it turned, it had a beginning, middle and end that made sense and that it, it did kind of flow and it, 
it gelled a lot in the in the very end when we finally put the ending onto this the 11 years and we shot the 12th year and put it together the ink was barely dry before we screened it at Sundance and we had never really screened it for an audience before we screened it for 50 people here locally yeah with the ending and then we went to Sundance and I was like oh my god what are people going to think and it was pretty exhilarating to have you know a standing ovation for that film so um that is my proudest film but in terms of a scene I would have to say it's a car scene in Before Sunset oh, yeah. where um Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke are having this kind of very animated argument and it was just you know there was a ton of footage and they were just going in circles, driving in this car and the cars was stopped and then it was going and then the background was changing and Julie was kind of having a meltdown and people were forgetting their lines and it was so challenging to cut it. And it turned out to be one of my favorite scenes in terms of interaction between characters. Hmm. Is it because it felt more real or what was it that made it? I mean, I just, I know the challenges putting it together yeah. and and then to see it play so effectively I, it just makes you happy that you can make something happen like that <laughs> it's interesting because i like i thought you would might reference school of rock and the reason i was thinking of that is because i remember reading a review talking about how basically uh, richard and his team figured out how to harness Jack Black's <laughs> energy and turn it into a positive. How did you, when you get footage, when you got, we're getting footage for like that, how do you assess your rushes? How do you uh, determine what you want to use in, in your process? That was an embarrassment of riches. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that Jack Black is the most disciplined actor you can imagine. I expected there to be like yards and yards of ad libs and, just, oh really? You know, I, made I expected it. No, that too. No, not at all. He wow. was ready, rehearsed, and every take. I mean, it just every take nailed it. It was he was fantastic, and um, he's so hardworking. I I mean, I can't say one single negative thing about that experience. But it was between Jack Black and Joan Cusack and the kids. It was. Um, it was pretty, in terms of a comedy, I had never cut a comedy mm. per se like that before. And, I, and so I was in my mind thinking, oh, I'm going to have to like cut faster, funnier, stupider or something like that. Yeah. But that was not the case because the actor's natural timing mm. of their delivery and responses was so perfect. It really helped was a little bit of a blueprint for putting that movie together. But yeah, thank, well, God, thank goodness there was no like unleashed Jack Black that I had to deal with. Well, I, I almost feel like maybe that's just like a, like, um, like a story that sort of bubbled that he's got like so much energy, but then meanwhile, he's just really hardworking. It's hardworking. And I mean, I think he and Rick and Mike White who wrote it, mm -hmm. it was the perfect you know, there are some films that I feel like it's like the perfect combination of personalities and material. Mm -hmm. And that was one in my career where I can say it was the perfect storm for that film. Um, the energy, the not the music knowledge. Rick is like a walking encyclopedia of music. Mm -hmm. And so is Jack. And, uh, and so is Mike. So, you know, it was it was blessed that project was blessed. I have one last question for you. We've been stuck in this pandemic for two years now. And depending on where you are in the world or what's happening with the numbers, you might be under lockdown, you might be under certain rules. And so a lot of people have turned to streaming services at that in their, these times. Is there a show or a movie you've discovered in the last two years that you think people should check out? I'd be surprised if everybody on the planet hasn't watched it, but I would say that Schitt's Creek was definitely my, my the one that saved me, especially yeah. early on in yeah. the pandemic. 
I watched the first four or five episodes and I was like, I don't know, this might not be yeah. for me. But then I really got into it. And it, every night before bed, it was just like my bedtime viewing. It was really, really fun watching. So if you haven't seen it, I would be surprised, number one. And secondly, I'd say, go watch it. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because that one always feels like it took the first season to figure out what it was, mm -hmm. which is what you hear about some of the great shows like Seinfeld. Their first season was them figuring out, you know, Cheers and all these shows. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because like, like the studios don't allow for that <laughs> anymore. It's like you got to be a hit out of the gate, which is unfortunate. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. Thank you so much for having me. Been a That's pleasure. It for that's it for this week. Uh, make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses. And of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out aja.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.